It's great to be here today with John Verbeke and Chad, better known in this corner as Chad the Alcoholic. Hi, guys. Hey there. Hello. And, um, we have a, we're having to get together today because Chad had this idea about a great topic to talk to John about. John Verbeke is uh, well known in this little corner for his work in cognitive science, and I would say probably building a more relational community or building relationships between people, helping to understand the meaning crisis better. And Chad is well known in this little corner for just having some deep insights about the way life works. And uh, so if it's okay with you guys, I'm going to let Chad explain the reason for our get together because it was his idea. And so I don't want to misstate anything. So why don't you take it away, Chad? Well, <laughs> thanks, Karen. Hey, John, it's really great to see you. And uh, before we get going, I wanted to thank you for um, all that you've all that you've been contributing over the last several years and it was really great to meet you over in uh, Chino and I very much appreciate you um, and thank you for taking your time to have this strange conversation which I've like <laughs> I've been like I've been like ripping my hair out trying to figure out the best way to lay this out because um, it, it seems like such a really short topic, um, but so so the, the topic the, the topic is, and I can't remember. There was a video that you were doing, and it ins it inspired something. I don't remember the video it was that you were in, or that you were uh, that mm -hmm. I commented on this, but it inspired something that I had been thinking about for a while. Um, so the topic is. Um, um, something like the unintended consequences of well-meaning and good institutions. It's mm -hmm. something like this. And the, the, the intuition that I've had, um, and I want to be very careful because, um, so, so for, for one, and for anybody who doesn't know why this weirdo here is talking with this mask. I, I'm a recovered member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, I've been a member for <clears throat> going on 10 years. Um, and I, it's, it's a, a, a practice that I hold as one of the highest in my life. I, it's, it means a great deal to me. Um, that being said, um, there are things that happen that I, I think happened. I don't know if this is true or not. I'm not, I'm not a great researcher or I'm not a scientist or anything like this, but there are intuitions that I've had where the impact that Alcoholics Anonymous had, not as an organization, but the principles that it had or that it has and the, how those principles had an impact on people um, that recovered and ended up taking some of these principles and bringing them into their professional lives in um, hospitals and uh, in therapy, and then how that um, would eventually change uh, uh, attitudes and language around uh, therapy and people's approaches to addiction in general eventually would make, I think, its way out of that and into um, uh, legislation and lawmaking. Now, AA never has never um, had any stance on any of this stuff officially. It's always had, it's, it has no opinion on outside issues. So it's not AA, it's people that were members who took these ideas and um, uh, I think eventually it made its way into the the medical fraternity, which eventually made its way into law, where you you would have, um, I think, in 1970, uh, the Hughes Act came about. And I don't know a whole lot about it, but I know it, it made things accessible to people, uh, tools accessible to people in the, in, uh, who, are, who have addiction problems and alcoholism problems. And then I think it eventually made its way out of that and into the culture and started shaping language in the actual culture in a way that is, they were, they are good principles, 
but I think the intuition was is they didn't have they didn't have the the constraints that um, AA traditions have that keep keep them boxed in, right? So they went from they went from um, principles that would help set somebody free and into a, a life of freedom w- within a domain, and then they made its way out of that and into the culture where they set these principles free into a realm of chaos. Which uh, so that's my general. Mm. Meander on it, um, and I was just—I uh, was—I guess I was wondering how how have you seen that? And then I know, like you know, what, kind of what we're doing in the co- in the corner. I I'm always thinking about um, the the traditions that and the insight that they had AA had in creating traditions, and what what can we as as this little emerging community. Mm-hmm. What can we draw from that and the wisdom that we can draw from that so that we don't do some of the things that um, well-meaning people did that Mm. may have have done some harm? So that's my general thing. I don't know what else to say about it. What do you think about that? Um, Well, first of all, um, I like the posing of the problem and the formulation. um I, I i think uh making it reflective upon what's happening in this little corner i think is also an excellent proposal um i'm this issue about taking things out of their origin and transplanting them um is is also bound up with an issue i've been thinking about a lot about uh, which is the issue of transfer and how do you get things to transfer broadly and deeply into people's lives um, and, the, and the proposal that a good ritual is one that transfers broadly and deeply and effectively and virtuously and a bad ritual is one that stays in its context or binds people into something narrow but the issue of how how to transfer virtuously is a powerful one uh, so i've been very critical to give you something in in in, in my wheelhouse about the transplantation of Buddhism um, into the mindfulness industry, and then and then the reduction. The, there was, was this entire ecology of practices, and one thing was taken out: meditation on a particular kind, and it was transferred, and it's become well reduced to what is now, I think, rightfully criticized as mic mindfulness, and its capacity <laughs> to transform people um, has been significantly reduced, and it's been largely co-opted. I mean, its main function. For many people is to make them satisfied with their life as a corporate drone um which is not what the buddha was after i think is a reasonable thing to say so i'm very familiar uh with thinking about this i'm not i don't know if i have anything um insightful to say but maybe something will come up emerge in discussion but yeah and there's a lot about trying to figure out how do you this is what a lot of the work I've been doing about the design principles for ecologies of practices. How do you get practices so that they, as you said, they're in a system of constraints with each other so that they don't do this? I mean, when when they, it's uh, the, the metaphor that's in my mind is like an invasive species, invasive species, like you take the rabbit and you land it in Australia and it turns into a disaster because it's removed from all of the environmental constraints it had in the natural environment. And I think social practices uh, behave in very similar ways. Um, uh, now, we need to try to compare that to where we have transplanted things uh, successfully. Like, you know, the potato was originally in the Andes mountain cultures, and, and now it's successfully transplanted into Europe. Um, and so um, I, I would very much like to talk about that issue about um, like in this little corner of the, the, of the internet, we are experimenting with a lot of things and I think that's good. Uh, but how do we, uh, how do we properly reflect on um, and be cautious around this transplantation problem? Uh, I'm, that's what I'm sort of calling it. Uh, and, and how do we, and so for me, there's a, there we're caught because if we throttle too much, no, no transplanting, then we don't allow transfer and transfer, Transfer is how things are transformative. Um, so 
I, I'm I'm just reformulating the problem and, and giving it back to you. And first of all, asking if that reformulation feels lands okay with you. Does that how does that sound? I think so. I think it sounds I think it sounds right. And and it's interesting because I'm not sure if it was as much as much of practice that leaked out mm. as as much as it was um attitudes around ah i see so i mean then there's sort of levels at which we can talk about there's there's practice and there's principles uh, first of all separating principles from practices is a disaster um i think that's uh that's almost always a bad thing uh yeah. because because you you're just you're just contributing to propositional tyranny and you think you can capture in statements what have to happen <clears throat> in states of people's lives um so I think that's a problem. Um, but I think we could also ask the question around practice, because my example is one of practice. The Buddhism yeah. thing gets translated and transplanted and um, it gets truncated and trivialized and really uh, redirected in a way that I think is no longer very virtuous. Uh, now, Rick Repetti would disagree with me. He says... Some mindfulness is always better than no mindfulness, but um, I'm still very critical of what's what, uh, of what happened uh, by doing that. Um, so, so if if this lands for you, um, what what uh, what did you see people doing in that community? Like, did the did AA just remain silent? Uh, was there an attempt to uh, engage in a critique? Was there uh, any attempt uh, to to try and reformulate the principles so that they were more in line with the original vision um well so again um aa itself aa itself had um has a very strong um stance on we have no opinion on outside issues so the, the the organization aa doesn't they don't and i think that's good i think we have yeah what what we have is um, uh, an aim towards a primary uh, our, our 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 primary purpose, which is one alcoholic helping another alcoholic, mm -hmm. and then and and we wanted to stay out of um, opinions about medicine, opinions like so. In other words, things like um, a lot of people will believe that. Um, you know, my alcoholism might be onset by genetics. Sure, but AA has no opinion on that. Or mm -hmm. it might be a trauma. Sure, but AA has no opinion on that. What, what we have is, well, we found an answer that works. We don't really want to start muddling with that, and and we don't want to engage in any in any. I mean, me as an AA member right now, I'm 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 walking a very fine line here. In fact, I called a guy that I trust very much who is very well known um in that community who knows this stuff and i, I wanted his, his uh, direction and insight on this because i i wanted to know if i was even doing a good thing by making this call um and he so he hasn't gotten back to me so that's it's fine um but um there was just so it did it did actually we could we could say here's a fact that the the discovery that that aa makes with um uh by this this these practices of um having a spiritual awakening mm -hmm. um and diagnosing of uh the problem uh uh or 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 pointing out the problem that it's not the 12th the 12 drink that gets you drunk it's the first drink all those things had a direct a direct impact on how medicine will view it from like for the rest since then mm -hmm. um so that's that's a one thing we could point to i think that was good um and um and and there are, but like i think one another thing where things got weird was um as far as i understand when they used to take alcoholics um and put them in asylums because there was really no you know there was no way of helping these guys they were just like right. eh, well 
lock him up, you know, and, and my understanding is they stopped doing that. And I think that was a good, but in, in a sense, there was something that wasn't a good about it. I don't know what that is, but I think it relates to, there's something that happened, I think in the, in the eighties where they, they, st they let a lot of people out of hospitals. Yeah. yeah Deinstitutionalization. Yes. Right. And I think that's all tied kind of similarly. Oh, so historically, do you think uh, that sort of bled out? Is that what you're saying? Yes, I think I, that's my opinion, and especially since the, like, so when this doctor, um, this guy that's in the, the book, his name is Dr. Silkworth. He's the guy that's in the doctor's opinion in the very, very beginning. He has this theory of that that maybe the alcoholic, the chronic alcoholic, which is different from the acute alcoholic, but maybe he has something that looks like, an, it looks like an allergy, where once he drinks, he has this physical reaction to alcohol. He might not even be physically addicted to it, but something happens to him that triggers a, a, a what they call phenomenon of craving, which begs for more. So it's like, I don't break out into hives, I break out into an insatiable desire for more drinks. And, and uh, but and then when when once he burns his life to the ground and he says, I can't do this, I'm done, I'm done, I really mean it this time, he eventually circles back to the drink. So that would be like a chronic alcoholic. Mm -hmm. An acute alcoholic might be so, somebody who um who was maybe even physically addicted to alcohol, but then he gets um separated from alcohol in a dry out joint. After four or five days, he's He's not physically addicted anymore and he moves on and he never drinks again and his life gets good. Right. So there's kind of like the chronic alcoholic, like me, my problems really begin once the alcohol is removed. <laughs> so I'm left with basically the meaning crisis. This is why I identified so much with, with some of what you're saying in that. And um, so this, this doctor at the time, the Silkworth guy, when he comes up with this theory of this allergy, he's making something like the equivalence of like $22,000 a year in today's money. Right. So basically there's, he's making nothing, right? And his life is dedicated to trying to help alcoholics and he's having virtually no luck helping alcoholics. Right. And so I, I, I mean to say this because there was, it wasn't a business. Nobody wanted to do anything to do with helping alcoholics because it, they were a hopeless lot. You couldn't help these people. They were just, it was just a total dead end all around. And then these couple of drunks accidentally find the solution and it, and it gets replicated and it's replicated and replicated. And after, you know, a few years, they find that like 40 people are staying sober and it's like discovering a new continent. And that's that's where the book comes from. So this whole thing was discovered by just laymen, and the doctor endorsed it, which is great. And then later comes big business around it. So like today, it's big business to try and help alcoholics and other addicts and stuff. Like there's a lot of money to be made there. I'm not saying that's their entire motive, but you know, mm -hmm. I think there's something to do with that. Whereas we don't have any profit motive. You know, like we don't make money. Um, it's it's all for fun and for free. Um, so that's like a, a principle um, that, that kind of leaks out there too. But once, like I said, in 1970, there was this thing called the, the Hughes Law where there were actual, um, I don't want to name their names. You can find this if you want. There's a, a gal who heads this thing with this guy Hughes who was one time, Hughes was the governor of Iowa. He gets, as far as I understand, he gets to become governor because he kind of taught, he, he kind of sells himself as this recovered alcoholic and his whole life is great. And then he goes and he like gets this prominence through this, this, you know, this avenue. And then he, they put into law and this is where the idea of alcoholism as disease comes into full view. This is, you know, and so like, I, I don't believe alcoholism is a disease. I believe it's an illness. I believe that's what the book calls it. Um, I think there's a big difference between uh, between the two. And 
So, yeah, I think there's, there's something about all of that. Again, I have to apologize. I'm, if When you talk with me, I'm always this way. I'm always like, uh, la, la. so please forgive me. I'm not. Well, that sounds like there's, there's a second issue then. So, the and um, if I'm hearing you right. So one issue is like the principles can be transplanted and that that can go wrong. The principles and practices can be transplanted and that can go wrong. And that could be relevant to this little corner. And then the other is the corruption problem, which is the problem, uh, right, that, um, you know, and I was talking to somebody today, right? And and so there's people now uh, coming to me and offering me money and some degrees of power and influence. And, um, and then I've seen other people, not necessarily in this corner of the internet, <clears throat> but known by this corner of the internet, uh, where the, the fame and the power and the money came very rapidly and it, it had a deleterious effect on them um, and a corrupting effect. Um, and uh, we talk a lot about that <laughs> every week at the Verveke Foundation about what can we do because um, you're in the bind you want you want obviously we want to influence people we think there's a problem and we want to educate and education is a form of influence or persuasion because right? if you're not doing that you're being violent or you're deceiving people um, and so you want to influence people and that means um, and and then that brings with it the the possibilities uh, and so I, I've been trying to put in all kinds of safeguards. That's why I set up the Verveki Foundation. And I have it's being run by people other than me. Um, I mean, I have a say in it, but I don't have I don't have single or absolute say. Uh, and, and I've been trying to think about ways of presenting material. Uh, I, I've been trying to present material with multiple people and not just me as a single voice so that the focus is on the work or the practice and not on me. Uh, I, I try to give a, a enormous credit. I try to, uh, as, as much as I can, like just sometimes people get annoyed with it, but I'm going to keep doing it uh, because that also helps. Um, I do think we need to think about, um, uh, and this is a challenge for this little corner because we don't want this corner to become um, a corporation. Uh, but we do need to talk about something like a code of ethics uh, uh, and um, and also recommendations we can make to each other. Now, right now, Jonathan and Paul and I, we act as we're all we're, we're close friends. So we act as really good constraints on each other. Um, but um, uh, I, uh, Chad, I don't I don't know if I have anything particularly insightful. I just well, all I can say is I'm very concerned with this problem. And I work on it on a regular and reliable basis. And I discharge power and responsibility to other people so that they can correct and challenge me. Um, and I've got an arm's length relationship with the money. Um, and uh, yeah, but I, yeah. I wonder if I could just offer a, an, yeah, please. an alternate frame. Um, and not not because I think you need a different frame, but sometimes if you frame it a little bit differently, you can come out of another direction. Please. Okay. So just the other day, somebody posted this article on Twitter, and I thought it was so interesting. And it's pertinent to a lot of things. It's a it's a kind of analysis of a book, and then several other books that seem to be following the same thread. The name of the article is "A Big Little Idea Called Legibility." Mm. Did you happen to see it, John? No, no, but I, okay. I keep going. Okay. I, I so so it, it's based on a book. It, it's the article is written by Venkatesh Rao. I, I don't know him, but I think he's <clears throat> somebody somebody knows because they said he would be good one to have a conversation with. Anyway, he's talking about James Scott's book, Seeing Like a State, How Certain Schemes to Improve the Human Condition Have Failed. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I'm going to show you a couple of illustrations from his article. I will share screen here. Okay. So can you guys see the screen here? Yes. Mm -hmm. So you see these pictures. 
on the on the my left, I'm looking at some nice natural trees. That would be illegible. And on the right is what um, the legible scientific forests, uh, what they did with forestry in the, I, I believe see. in the late 1800s in Germany to try to make everything more productive. <clears throat> right, right. Which ended up in a monoculture because when you plant the trees this yep. way, then nothing else grows there and nobody, no other animals or organisms hang out there. So it was a disaster. Another illustration is right here. Some researchers were doing some work with MRI scans and um, one of the researchers wanted to use this one on the right of these random dot uh, pictures. And the other researcher said, no, no, we can't do that because this random thing right here makes people so anxious that they'll want to get right out of the machine. Right, right. You have to show them something legible and calming like this checkerboard. So the big idea is here. Here's a list of the uh, the recipe of what happens with failed plans. You start with a complex and confusing reality, such as the social dynamics of an old city, or you could say alcoholism, sure. or you could say uh, obesity, because Weight Watchers followed the same trajectory that Alcoholics Anonymous did. Mm -hmm. Weight Watchers started with one woman dealing with her problem, writing a book about it, becoming famous, turning it into a gigantic industry, and, and it's failed all the way around. <clears throat> so you fail to understand all the subtleties of how the complex reality works. Then you attribute that failure to the irrationality of what you are looking at rather than your own limitations. And you come up with an idealized blank slate vision of what reality ought to look like. How can we clean it up and make it palatable and make it legible, make it nice and neat and tidy for the general public so that they will pay money for it, right? Then you argue that the relative simplicity and platonic orderliness of the vision represents rationality. Then you use authoritarian power to impose that vision by demolishing the old reality if necessary. And another yep. rational utopia fails horribly. So, I mean, this is the this yes. is the pattern. It happens over and over again, whether it's Weight Watchers or maybe with people like Howard Hughes bringing Alcoholics Anonymous ideas into. When, when you let it loose without boundaries, then you have to find some way of making it orderly and coherent. So you have to start creating artificial boundaries and then you end up with this same problem. And yeah. that's, that's I don't think I it's such uh, has fallen to this. I think there are people with different attitudes and different power um, <clears throat> uh, uh, motives in AA that, you know, and I was one of them for a while that has played this game, but AA is such, I would say no. But yes, it's. I think it's the individuals that like you're saying, well, right, but she, well, I'm, I'm not saying that this has anything to do with AA. It's what, like you said, it got transplanted into the larger culture without this, without the constraints, yeah. and then the constraints had to be imposed from outside. And this is what inevitably happens when you begin imposing constraints on something that is inherently complex and difficult to understand. Right, and that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and uh, this is uh, this is why I say on my tombstone, neither nostalgia nor utopia. Uh, exactly this uh, repeated history. Um, and uh, and this is why I resist people who say Verveke often, you know, tries to, everything is so complex. It's like, that's right. That's right, it is. Right? And well, I want it simpler. I, that's too bad. Right. <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry. I, I mean, making it accessible, making it understandable, I get. But making it simpler... Uh, it is very, very problematic because we've had a history of doing that and falling this falling into exactly this pattern again again. This is a version of the frame problem. Uh, the frame problem is is that there are always a, a vast number of unintended side effects. And so when like when you transplant something, you are unaware of all of you only see the one oh, it does this, it does X or it does Y and you don't see the whole web of side effects and how they're bound into all this complexity and there and then and, and you do exactly this you transplant it out 
And that's what I mean. It's like the invasive species. You take it out of the ecology where it's held in check by all of this complexity and you put it into a simple environment and then it runs amok precisely because there, is, there are insufficient constraints. And then as Karen rightly put it, what you then do is you supply the constraints from the outside through some authoritarian imposition, right? You make it, you try to make reality fit the, the simplistic model. I think, I think this is a bedeviling, uh, and I think nostalgia does exactly the same thing. It just projects it into the past rather than the future. Um, I'm very, very, um, uh, first of all, Karen, thank you for uh, doing that. I thought that was very clarifying. But I'm very, very resistant to this. And I think it does interact with the transplant issue. And I think it does interact with the corruption issue. Uh, and, and I I think that... Um, trying and this is goes into a lot of discussions i i had a series with jordan hall on governance and we began with the distinction between the complex and the complicated and the attempt to replace the complex with the complicated and then the complicated go through goes through what's called general system collapse and that's another explanation for why a lot of our institutions and structures are collapsing complexity is becoming overwhelming and the comp so when a system is complicated and it tries to deal with uh, complexity, what it does is it adds on more internal features. And then eventually the internal system, the internal the internal dynamics go up exponentially. So when I add one component, I just don't ratchet it. It goes up because all the ways it can interact with all the other parts and the frame problem becomes even more pressing. And you get to what's called general system collapse. This is what happens to the late uh, Western Roman Empire. You got this huge system built to try and deal with problems. And as the problems mount, the system becomes as problematic as anything it's trying to solve. Um, and that's why the utopias ultimately uh, fail. And so we're trying to uh, say that there has to be a shift and it's a really profound shift. It's like an axial age revolution shift where we try and no, we try and stop evolving traits in a complicated fashion. And we try to evolve our capacity for evolution in a complex fashion. And this is now a distinction in biology between the evolution of traits and the evol evolution of evolvability. And so certain things evolve not because they're a trait, but because they improve our capacity to evolve. Um, like sexual, sexual reproduction does that uh, in particular. Um, and there's many examples of that. And so the question, so the problem with that is that's all very abstract theory. What does that mean when we come down to concrete proposals about how people think and how they behave and how they organize themselves? Um, what does it mean to be organized instead of building complicated systems? How do we get complex dynamical systems that are uh, have a capacity to presumably avoid this, this well, general systems collapse? Um, and I mean, you can watch the series on governance and there's some ideas there, but at the, at, we're talking, that was at the level of governance. Um, so I'm, for me, that's, um, part of what I've been trying to do by, uh, uh, by trying to shift, um, or sorry, propose shifting, um, certain core notions, um, and, and thinking about, uh, you know, things in terms of their ongoing complexification rather than trying to get to some kind of completeness or conclusiveness. Um, um. Well, so one of the things that occurs to me is the, the whole notion of um, just the basic ideas of Austrian economics, which writ large would be just like distributed cognition is, is the best. <laughs> Because any sort of centralized um, <clears throat> control cannot possibly have as much information as all of individuals working, um, working yeah. in a dynamic, you know, society. Yeah, and that's why I agree with that deeply. That's why I've yeah. been trying to do a lot of work on distributed cognition. And... So, so that's like I, I just want to I want to lay out something here. So that's number one, and on on the other side, I think this is something that. I see the picture and I think that this picture has relevance to just about everything. So I'm not picking on, on Michael Levin, <laughs> I'm not picking on him at all. I have high regard for his work, but he tells this story often of the frog cells 
<clears throat> the frog skin cells that they scrape off into a Petri dish with some medium. And then those frog cells, and the way he tells the story, they finally get to do what they've always wanted to do, <laughs> become free from their task as, as skin cells. And then they can uh, gather together and they, they create this new being, this new entity that has motility and everything else because they, they reform. What's your word that you use? They, they. Exapt. Exapt. They exapt their capacities and yeah. use them for other purposes. And then they become a living entity that can actually reproduce by gathering other little skin cells into little balls like themselves. So they can only reproduce out one generation but, and they have the same DNA as the frog, but if somebody found one in a pond someplace, they, they wouldn't know that it was, and he had anything to do with a frog because it's completely different um, organism. But, so you have these skin cells that have been liberated from their task on the frog, but is that really liberation? <laughs> Because when they were in the frog, they had a very important purpose for the frog. Keeping the, the frog alive is a very important purpose. And they had community there. And, you know, and they were they were fitted in with other parts of the frog. So so they had lots of levels of complexity. And now it's this very simple little organism. So so I think there's something about this idea of the way that society is working now to to liberate things from their original intent like even this this idea of uh, the the principles and practices of uh, Alcoholics Anonymous gets liberated from the organization and now it can be put over here to better use helping more people on a broader scale blah 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 you know I think there's something about this whole issue of what is real freedom that comes in the midst of this. And, and that's how I tie it together with Austrian economics and distributed cognition. And so I'm not exactly sure how it all connects up, but I think there's something there. Okay, well, uh, I, I, I won't comment on Austrian economics, but I do think <laughs> the idea of uh, distributed cognition, I've been arguing that we should rethink uh, democracy as um, how we do relevance realization within distributed cognition in a self-correcting fashion. Uh, rather than as we've previously thought of it as a social contract between competing interests. Um, so I agree with that part. Um, I, I think- um, Can you say a little bit more about what you mean by that, John? Well, what I mean by that is, so in, in the sort of the enlightenment framing, we, we, we tend to push democracy towards adversarial processing where the point is to defeat the opponent. And, and, and you know, of course it comes to a particular fruition in American politics. Uh, where Americans are so divided and polarized. In fact, they are more afraid of people in the other party than they are of like China. Um, and this is like a reliable <laughs> poll result, right? And and so the capacity, so the democracy can be reformulated as opponent processing where I understand that both the left and the right, and there's other divisions now, um, uh, have a function and that each is the best others self-correction. So the best way I can correct you is if you and I commit, well, we can be in opposition to each other, but we commit to the process of self-correction. So I'm not trying to destroy you because I always recognize that I'm biased and self-deceptive and my best chance is, right, is to have you as a, you, you and I are loyal opposition. Uh, like a marriage, to, right? Yes, well, right? Yeah. Like, a, like a marriage. Uh, that's like in, in, the, in the domain of, ecological survival something like this like that's a domain that we share and that's why it's freedom. it is it, it is it is and and then the idea is opponent processing is of course how i argue relevance realization works and then you can see but democracy is doing it not for individual cognition it's doing it for or it can do it for collective cognition and then the and then the proposal is well could we once we reformulated that could we educate that opponent processing so that it's not just intelligent it's rational or perhaps even wise and and then it would be capable and that was that would be a way of evolving democracy and right 
complexifying it in the face of the complexities that it's facing, as opposed to trying to legislate particular laws in place in order to deal with the problems that democracy is facing. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. Karen, you're asking the question, yeah. gave me a, a, an opportunity to say what uh, what the different approaches are. Um, now, the thing about Michael's work, and, and, and we both love it, you're right, there's like liberating can be disastrous, but the thing you have to remember is this, if the cells don't have that capacity, they also lose their evolvability. And, and mm -hmm. so you see living things always toggling between like keeping that ability to run wild mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and mm -hmm. also uh, be can be uh, properly constrained. Because sometimes when we when we lift things off, right, and we liberate them, as you said, um, we we get a gain. So the Egyptians are doing all this stuff and measuring the earth. Right. Uh, but then the Greeks come along and say, we can actually abstract that off and create geometry. And then we get math and science. Go, mm -hmm. Right. So there's it, 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 it's it's it, it's this. Well, I'm arguing it's 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 a really difficult trade off uh, relationship. Now, there's one more point and then I'll shut up is you also then said this all hangs on also a reconsideration of what we mean by freedom. And I think that is also a fundamental issue. We have just we have understood freedom as uh, maximizing choice, which I think has been exactly a disaster, mm -hmm. like the way you've talked about. And I think freedom as uh, the capacity to bind oneself to the true and the good and beautiful, as like which came out of the Platonic and ultimately the Kantian and Hegelian tradition. D.C. Schindler talks about this a lot, and uh, Robert Brandom talks about this a lot. That is an, that is a notion of freedom that I think we need. Uh, to bring back because it's exactly about right binding yourself but you but not from like Kant's mo model is like the rational person is the person who can bind themselves uh, to norms to the true the good and the beautiful and because they do that that's what, exactly how they become rational and then they're worthy of respect that's so different from that view right like freedom is like I, I have 17 kinds of ice cream and right and it, 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 like and, and, well, and I think this is why I like the, I like the picture of marriage, even for democracy, because we used to have the sense as a nation that we were we bound ourselves together. Yes, because there was something good and true and beautiful about the whole. And then over time, we lost that sense of kind of having anything good and true and beautiful to stand up for and then everybody starts just protecting their own corner yes and so we weren't bound together in this marriage anymore that was a a mutual binding together i mean the men who who what was the phrase they they bound themselves to the honor of you know in in the con in the declaration of independence they they bound their sacred honor together because of something they believed in they didn't all agree on everything, but they did the opponent processing. They came up with something great. And we throw that away at our peril, I think, because then we're bound forever to be in this like nasty divorce with everybody hating each other. That's what it's like right now. It's like a divorce. Yeah, it toxic is. Toxic divorce. It's, it's yeah. easy to throw it away if you don't know what it is, though. Yeah. You know, like, I think. That's well said. You know. <sighs> This, this freedom thing, I, 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 it's like there's a difference between free and freedom. There's a big, big, big difference. Free is like just, I'm free. I'm That's like into the realm of chaos. I'm free to do whatever. This is how I can have whatever. 17 different, I'm free to have 17 different uh, kinds of ice cream all at once if I want. Or, and a, a big ass hunk of ribs or something. You know, like that's free. But like freedom is, is is music, <clears throat> you know. Like like real freedom, I think is is something like jazz. You have everybody knows what's what the body of music is. You know, you have your instrument. You're free to play your instrument in this realm of this song, and we're gonna be we're gonna play in this domain of freedom mm -hmm. called whatever you know, Lingus by Snarky Puppy, which is a great song if you haven't heard it. You should check it out. It's what it's it's like just opposite side. If you listen to that song, it's like it's like seeing the face of God. That's what I think. It's so amazing because and they capture it on film, which is beautiful. Anyways, it's that was that's freedom, you know, and like 
with that, you can see something that is ineffable and it makes you well up. It makes me well up with tears. It makes me feel like I'm so grateful to be a, a person. And like, that's freedom. That's what freedom can give me. Um, when I was free to do whatever I want, it's like I can have concepts of like what is good and all this stuff, but I don't, I'm so separated from them that it's like I said, it's easy. It's easy to throw these things away if you don't know what they are. <clears throat> and I think, so it's, it's cool to talk about democracy and all this different kinds of stuff. Great. But I think I, something is, there's some major underpinnings that have been removed somewhere. And I'm so grateful that like, you know, whatever has happened in the last few years, especially around this little corner. And I already had my own practices and rituals that I was engaging in and a, and a, a domain of freedom that I was in. And what I saw here was I want to be a part of this conversation because I think I can help bring something here. I don't know what exactly, but there's something here that I see uh, is very, very akin to what I found in in my in my tradition that I come from. And then aside of all that, you guys helped me find other things, which is great. Um, so yes, I think I think we we keep keep continuing to try to cultivate and do whatever this is. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I kind of went off on a little tangent there, but it's no, no, it was, it was good. Um, there's a, it was beautiful. Like, yeah. There's a stuff that I think about all the time as it relates to what this little corner is, is dealing with. And it's very fun. I love the, the goofiness of it. I love the seriousness of it. Sometimes it gets a little contentious, but that moment that you had, uh, with Paul and Chino, um, that was a yeah. that was a magical moment, and I agree. I agree. And it shouldn't be let go. Um, also, I get the sense that you guys can't carry it forever, and I think you guys probably get that sense too. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. what do we do about that? And like, that's why I keep telling guys, like, at least just become familiar with the th these like this in AA they have these things called traditions just look at them and see where they came from and take some insight from what that was because this guy Bill who ends up Bill Wilson he he knew that he wasn't going to live forever and he had wrote these things that were traditions that were helped keep us together because he knew that we would destroy ourselves from the inside out but he said here's these things now it's yours and it'll be around for as long as God wants it. So it's up to you. You know, the only reason why AA has been able to stay together is because of those and because they have the threat where we know that if we don't adhere to these simple things, we'll die drunk and maybe my grandchildren will too, which is an even greater problem. <clears throat> so that's, I feel like that, that level of responsibility is placed on all of us who are playing this, whatever this is. We have that responsibility because there is something that we're that we're brushing up against, and we don't even know what it is. I don't even know if we know, we know what our primary purpose is as this little corner. I think it's something like the ability to 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 talk and to to share these ideas to dialogos, so that we can do that, so that we can continue to do that. Also, so that we can continue to do that. So mm -hmm. it's like, like I, like I want to encourage people go out and write stories. I don't care if you're good at it or not. You have a responsibility. If you if you can hold a pen and you can think, like, because someday something like AGI is going to do that for you. But we have a responsibility to do it, whether we're good at it or not. Now that might be taking it a little too far, but I, that's how I think about this stuff. You don't have to be great at something to do something. I don't know. I'm rambling. I had a lot of caffeine, just so you know. No, no, no. Well, there, there's two issues that came up. One is the issue of tradition and what does that mean? Mm -hmm. um, and, and then the other issue is this. Um, Karen brought up 
but uh, and we we're talking about it a lot, but it's it's good to keep talking about it, which is this ability to orient to a, a, a greater whole, whole, a gestalt, something beyond individualism or just special groupism. Um, and those two are bound together because usually the orientation to the whole is also calling to a, a deeper sense of participation, like participation across generations. Um, and the thing is, of course, we, we don't have that shared tradition uh, uh, because uh, we just haven't been around long enough. Um, right. And, and so um, it's 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 whether or not, and, and this is an open question, whether or not we can make use of all this hyper technology to speed up and uh, do something like tradition. And but then, of course, we bump into the transplant problem. Can you take all this stuff and move it outside of established traditions and have it thrive? Um, now, of course, there's lots of proposals um about what the tradition might be uh and, and the, there's disagreement and what we need is um uh you know if we can come up with something that binds us all together like you were articulating that isn't necessarily um you know one particular group's property this is why I, I, my, my third series is going to be called walking the philosophical silk road because the Silk Road linked all these religions and civilizations together. Nobody lives on the Silk Road, mm -hmm. but people travel on it and they communicate it. It's it's the courtyard of dialogos rather than the courtroom yeah. of, of, of debate. And we did that. We have done that. And there's a there's a there's a there's there's a tradition of creating a meta tradition. It's historically extant, and I want to learn from it as uh, as much as I can in order to see. If we can come, if there are answers available to us about how we create something like what the Silk Road did for this little corner of the internet, and perhaps if it's not sounds too grandiose for the culture at large. Uh, yeah. Did, have you have you heard of this? Is have you ever heard of the Lunar Society? You've had to have heard of these guys. No. These guys, I can't remember their names. It was in Birmingham, over in the UK. Like they, there were just a bunch of people who would have these dinner parties. They would meet uh, on a full moon because then they could walk home at night safely. Some of these guys were like one of them was um, uh, Darwin's grandfather, Erasmus. Yes, and yeah. he met with the guy who was like well known for making steam engines available for factories and stuff. These right. guys would all meet together and. They, they wanted to make things accessible so that the world would be a better place. It would be easy to say, well, they wanted to get rich and stuff. Sure, but they also wanted to make things accessible. I think actually we're actually downstream from the Lunar Society, which wasn't a real society. They were just, it, it's exactly what you guys are doing, like you and and, and Jonathan and and Paul and, and possibly even Jordan. You know, like you guys are these guys who are meeting up in, in finding the things, potential, you're trying to, you may be tripping over solutions that will maybe even counteract with, in a good way, what the original Lunar Society did. I don't know, if you, if you ever get a chance, check them out. It's like, this, it's a very <laughs> interesting thing. Like, they have... Great name. It's a great name. It, it sounds yeah, I mean, like... A yeah. profound uh, impact on the world, and we are dealing with it right now. And... <clears throat> Well, so, that would be great if we could do something like that. Um, yeah, I think that's, and, and we get to have fun doing it, which is well, kind of cool. I mean, uh, Paul and I, and I, I got to try and get uh, Jonathan to answer the email. We've been talking with Justin Wells, and he's proposing making a documentary about this little corner of the internet, hmm. uh, which might help give people, again, uh, a sense of what we share and um, how we can build that uh, or or. Build that silk road. He's, he's uh, hard at work on it right now. He's been working like mad the last couple of weeks. He's talking now about it being full length documentary. So I yeah. got to the first footage. Nanny, nanny, boo. <laughs> <laughs> well, I talked to him uh, a, a few days ago as well. Uh, I'm glad to hear he's working on it so hard because I I gave it wholehearted my wholehearted two thumbs up. I think it's yeah. a great idea. Um, we got to get um. Jonathan to answer his email from Justin. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll reach, out to, re reach out to Jonathan to do that. So well, and I mean, while I have a little bit of a public face right here, I, I 
Um, Justin asked if anybody has any little clips of Mary that were particularly memorable oh. to let him know. So if, if anybody out there has a clip of Mary Cohen that was particularly memorable to you, please put a note in the comments or get hold of Justin so that we can get him that. Excellent. That's good. I'm glad to hear that. So, I mean, people are trying to create the lore, which is really good. Um, mm -hmm. That's a, that's a good beginning. Um, I, I, I wish I had something more profound to say about this. I mean, I recognize the problem. I recognize the problem of utopia and nostalgia. I recognize the transplant problem, the corruption problem. Everybody knows about that. Try to deal with that. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, this issue, this issue about establishing a tradition um, in this pluralistic uh, short period of time, pluralistic pr pluralism of perspectives in a very short time. It's a very, I, I again, I right. I, I, I've been looking for historical parallels and the only one I can find is the Silk Road. And that's why I want to try and deep dive deeply into it and, and see what can be gleaned from it. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be a different series because I'm actually going to go to the places too and film and location. Um, and I'm going to try wow. and put myself through this sort of arduous uh, pilgrimage um, <laughs> and, and undergo the transformation. Um, so, I mean, did that's a, that's a long, did that's a, you pardon see me? The did you see the series they did on the Silk Road a couple of years ago? No. Oh, it's, it's so excellent. There might might give you some ideas for where you want to go for your filming and everything. I'll see if I can find a link to it. If you could and send that to me, I would greatly appreciate that. Um, yeah. Like, I, I, it won't be exactly the Silk Road because I want to also like pick up p pivotal figures uh, uh, around this because um, mm -hmm. I'm going to be sort of talking about Neoplatonism from the West and Zen from the East and uh, meeting in Samarkand kind of uh, thing. And what does that mean? Um, so, because those were the two things that sort of uh, act as the lingua franca, the lingua philosophica along the Silk Road. Um, mm -hmm. So Neoplatonism allows uh, the Jews and the Christians and the Muslims and, and even uh, parts of Northern India to, to all talk to each other. And then Zen of course is getting Taoism and Buddhism and uh, uh, other aspects of, of of the East to all talk to each other. And then we now had the Kyoto School. We had the East and the West, Zen and Neoplatonism talking to each other. So we have precedent. So that's what I'm going to try and do. It's very ambitious and I'll, I'll probably be crushed by the gods for my hubris. But that's a long way of saying I'm, I'm really trying to address this issue you've raised about, uh, you know, about the problem of tradition um, and, and how does it balance between liberation and constraint and trans transplant for and invasive invasive species? Um, so I, I might have a better answer two years from now. So just just for um, so the way that the the traditions in AA were formulated, um, they say that they were pounded out on the anvils of experience, mm. which means they. Like they would, they paid, Bill paid attention to the the shortcomings. And he said, here's one thing we need. We need unity at all costs. And then like, as you, by the time you get to the 12th tradition, it talks about um, spiritual anonymity is the foundation of all the traditions, mm. which is also the same as unity, right? Because it's like, it's not about what Chad wants. It's about what we have here this and so like there's all these traditions that they have self-supporting through our own contributions we don't take donations all these different things they're they're uh we don't you know we don't have opinion on outside issues all the, those are all traditions and they're all derived out of our our fallings and so that's maybe one way of yeah one way of approaching these which i'm sure you know this already no 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 but, I, I no no I, you, you didn't say anything irrelevant where where i've tried to think along those lines and you can see me doing it with other people is talking about design principles um because that's what those are like design principles they're principles for how will we be organized how will practices be organized how will the organization be organized and um yeah and 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 uh, uh and i've been doing chris master pietro and i have been trying to do kind of sorry i'm not trying to put myself in the same status uh, as bill but we're trying to do that reflection and, and look at uh, a lot of the mistakes and the failings uh, both perennial ones and more historical examples and come up with 
design principles and, you know, talking with other people like Jordan Hall about that. I've talked to a, a lot, um, Taylor Barrett and others and um, really That's trying like, to get clear. Everybody, if, ever, if, if everybody had the approach that Bill had, which is, it wasn't about Bill, it was about what can he do for his fellows, then we'd all be great. You know what I mean? You know, which, well, no, I, you I, I, yeah, I, I, Well, I mean, I, 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 I think... I think that's right. I, I don't know that's sufficient. I think Bill, um, I think there well, there was a lot of other people that we didn't hear from because uh, they might have had good intentions and that's the road to hell is paid. Right. But they they also don't, ha he had a particular, I, I'm i surmising, he had a particular excellent balance of character, humility, uh, insight, competence, the capacity for self-reflection, ability to communicate and listen to other people. So there's also mm -hmm. a whole set of virtues that I think, um, in, in addition to his intent, that made Bill successful. Um, and that's the kind of thing we, we are talking about. Um, we need to t raise that conversation to the level, like I was trying to do with the democracy example, is what are the virtues for the this little corner of the internet that we should be talking about? Not just our individual, but what should our collective virtues be? That's what I meant by a code of ethics. But code sounds like legislation is probably the wrong term. But like what what is the ethos of this little corner of the internet? Um, what are the virtues that we want uh, this corner to be uh, practicing and exemplifying? And that's that's how I would respond to what you said about Bill. I think we we're doing a very good job about talking at the individual level of like, what, what are, how, do, how can you become a more virtuous person? But I think this little corner needs to talk about it at the collective level, the distributed cognition level. What's our ethos? Uh, which I, doesn't I, mean we have to have the same metaphysics or right, the same ontology, but what's our shared ethos? I, I agree 100%. With, with that, is there anything that like somebody like me could be doing to, to um be helping helping you with this you're, you're doing it you're doing it this is it like do this more we need and uh we need more people that have tr and this is where the, the 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 good the virtuous and, and and with virtuosity transfer come in people who have relevant experience in other domains to come in and speak it to us um because because like like you said and, and what's interesting about alcoholic anonymous is it you know, it's 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 sort of vaguely associated with the Christian tradition, but it doesn't claim a Christianity, right? And it's right. stand, it, it's it, it's in some ways, it's it, it's it's a precedent and provenance for what this little corner is trying to do because it situates itself between, right, not outside, but between all these religious traditions, and then tries to come up with an ecology of practices for helping self-destructive, self-deceptive behavior. So you constantly speaking on behalf of that as an exemplar, I think is itself exemplary. And I think you should keep doing it. We we need more examples of exactly what AA did, because I think that's where, where we can do what this little corner needs to have done. Well, that was a great conversation. I don't know what else to say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that that's Jonathan's thing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know what I don't know what else to tell you. No, no, no. I don't know what <laughs> yes. else to tell you. And then you need Paul's laugh. <laughs> yes. Whoosh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. This was great. Thank you guys very much. Um, maybe we can do this again sometime. But this was great. And onward. I, 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 I'm happy. Reach out when, whenever you want. Uh, and you know, is my schedule is accommodating? I, I, I. I, I I'm happy to do this. I, I'm glad we we did this. Um, uh, we need to do more of this. We need to have more of I don't know what to call us the 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 the, the people that have more salience talking to people who are more in the community uh, in this public fashion so we can share it and get it flowing more. I think this was an excellent thing to do. I'd like to do more of it. Well, I, Wait, I like it. your new camera setup, John. Yeah, the Verveke Foundation paid for uh, a studio. We have uh, the professional lighting, the professional mic, the professional camera. It looks uh, really good. It's just like you're right here in our living room. Very <laughs> well, good. Well, it's good. And 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 uh, my partner is really really happy about it. She she's always like, you should have your don't sit on your couch like so so so, so, so she's really really pleased with it too. So. Well, we'll miss the couch, but. 
We love yeah. the book. And, and that <laughs> lovely picture behind your couch too. Yeah. Uh, she gave me that. It's actually a full blown tapestry, right? It's quite large. It's from Morocco. Uh, I, I am, I'm attracted to, I have a desert aesthetic. I like mm -hmm. movies like Lawrence of Arabia. And so she gave that to me. Uh, it, it's, it, it, it's, I find it very entrancing actually. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Have a great week. I am off to Maui. So. Oh, <laughs> that's too bad. I'll talk to you when I get back. <laughs> Okay, have a great time. Chad, thank it was you. really good to get to talk with you at length. Yes, thank you. Thanks for the great idea for a conversation, Chad. We'll yeah. talk soon. Yep. Okay, bye-bye. All right, thanks. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.